Tonight, uh, like I said, this is the first time we've, we've taught this class. Uh, this is completely newly developed, so I hope you guys like it. Um, and if you don't, let me know afterwards what we can change for next time around, okay? It's a very, very important subject when it comes to brain health. Um, and it's something that starts, it starts early in life. But, but let me tell you something, it starts wherever you're at. You can start to make changes even today to try and make things better for your health and your brain as we're moving forward, okay? So, I call it Brain Boot Camp. It's not going to be that intense. There are going to be a few little times where you will have the ability to interact. Um, some of them a little bit more than others, okay? So, I just ask you guys to humor me, play along. <laughs> we're not here to embarrass anybody. We're just going to have fun, okay? Um, some of the things that we do will be things that if, if I do a neurological exam on one of my patients, these are some of the tests that I do. So you guys are getting this all for free. So if you want to participate, participate, right? Yeah. Um, a brief overview, and I know this is, you know, for those of you who are sitting kind of the middle, kind of small, for those of you sitting in the back, you have that TV in the back you can refer back to. Um, but I'll hit the main points of all these, these different slides. But we're going to talk about... Uh, what I'll refer to as functional brain areas, and I'll kind of explain to you what that means as we go through and talk. What the brain requires in order to be healthy, so that'll be under the brain requirement section. Signs of brain dysfunction, like I said, that's where we'll refer to some to the, the two sheets that I handed out for you. And then the very, very end, we'll talk about the, the good stuff. We'll talk about what can we do to start targeting and rehabilitating our brains and making it better for the future, okay? So unfortunately the good stuff comes at the end, but we got to get through some of the basics here at the very beginning just so we have the framework and an understanding for what is going on, okay? Before we begin, a few different terms that I'll probably use with you guys throughout the night, so I want you to have a good understanding of what I'm talking about. The first one is neurodegeneration, and it's kind of easy to understand, it's neurological degeneration just kind of bunched together into one word. Uh, I might use just, uh, I might use the term neuro, neural degeneration, I might use neurological degeneration, or just degeneration as a whole. Know that we're referring to the nervous system specifically tonight. We're not talking about joints or anything like that uh, at this point. Neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity refers to a concept of our brains changing over a period of time based on what's going on in the environment around it and the, the internal environment of our bodies. Just like you can take plastic things, you can kind of mold them and shape them. That's exactly what this is referring to, that we can mold and we can shape our brains to a certain point, even though uh, we're not babies anymore. Uh, that's when a lot of these things are growing and developing, but we can change these things as we go through life. A healthy brain is one where plasticity is greater than degeneration. And I give you this little illustration here. There's this little kidney pushing up against this big, huge sumo wrestler. And the sumo wrestler is just kind of looking down at him. And of course, we want brain plasticity, neuroplasticity to be the big sumo guy who's staying nice and big and he's not moving. And degeneration, because there's all kinds of things in our environment that are going to cause degeneration, is what we'll talk about as we go through and, um, and cover the presentation tonight. But if we keep those things to a minimum and keep plasticity to a maximum, we're going to keep our brains very healthy. So that's really the key concept I want you guys to understand as we move forward. We want to keep the brain healthy by improving plasticity and reducing degeneration. I, we could be done right now and you would have the, the, the big idea of the presentation, but I'll dive into some of the specifics. So here it is, test number one. You guys have your sheets, you have your pen. What, you, uh, what you're going to do for this, you're going to have 60 seconds. You're going to try to think, as, uh, think of as many words, beginning with the letter that I'm going to give you, okay? So you guys can use your blank sheet of paper for this. Um, that's okay. I'll, I, I, I still have a few more directions to give you. So you're going to, like I said, think of as many words as you can that begin with the letter that I'm going to give you. But what I ask you is don't use proper names. So if we're using F, don't use Fred, don't use Ferguson can't use uh, the same word in a different form, so you can't use fry, frying, and fried. I know. That's tough, isn't it? And please, no profanity. Okay? If you do, just don't share your answers with us. Okay? Everybody ready? Ready, set, and here we go. What letter? 
Sorry. I'm sorry. I forgot to advance the slide. Pencils down. No. All right. How did we do? How many people had, well, let's, let's move on. I won't tell you the grading scale first. How many people had five or less? Or let's start this way. How many people had more than five? Good, very good. How many people had more than eight? Okay, how many people had more than nine? Okay. Greater than nine, we would consider a good working memory, good functional brain, okay? Less than nine is less than optimal. If you get two or three, you have a pretty poorly functioning brain. Okay, so thankfully I saw pretty much everybody's hand went up for five, six. Um, so I'm doing pretty good with that, okay? Thank you guys for interacting with me on the first one. That's, that's the easy one, okay? This one's pretty easy too. So what I want you to do, and I know some of you guys in the middle are going to be a little bit of a disadvantage, but I have this picture here, and I just want you to look at it here for a few seconds. And I just want you to kind of take in some of the, the images from it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you a few different questions about this. So just pay attention to some of the details. I'm working on more visual memory here. Okay. Yeah. We're going to move on to the next slide, and I have a few questions. First question, how many buildings are there? Are supposed to write it down? You can write it down, or you can just answer. Three buildings? Okay. Would everybody agree with that? Three buildings? Three buildings. Some people would might might count that one over there as a building. Okay, maybe four if you were counting that, but theoretically, three buildings, okay? How many street lamps are there? Did anybody look at those? What do we have? Nine? Eight. Eight? Eight of them? I'm pretty sure eight is the correct number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Very nice. Okay. Next question. Sorry, I know for those of you guys in the middle, those were a little bit hard to see. What shape are the bushes next to the building? <laughs> I know there's lots of little things you didn't even realize about this picture, right? I know about the little ones. The little ones were what shape? Little rounds. Do you know how many, how many there were? Seven. Seven. Oh my gosh. I know. Oh. The shapes next to the building are cones. Oh, I, didn't count, I didn't shapes, count those yeah. around the yeah. I got inspired. Yeah, these ones over here, yeah. these ones here. Yeah, I didn't, you know, didn't count them. I only saw I can't see them here. <laughs> what shape is the middle building? Round. Round. Or cylindrical, yes. What color is the bus? Red. Red? Red? Okay, good. Excellent. Fun little tests, right? <laughs> Just little things to kind of get your yeah, brain working like a little it. bit. You don't like it? Need <laughs> binoculars. Yeah, I, I know, I'm yeah. sorry. A bigger screen, bigger screen. That's what we need. Okay, so just to kind of get your guys' brains working a little bit, we started off with those, and we'll do a couple other ones like that, all right? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about functional brain areas here, though. The first thing is we have to understand that our brains, what you see, you know, on Halloween, and like if you, if you Google brain on the Internet, what that really is, it's a collection of billions of cells, billions of nerve cells, um, they estimate that there's 100 to 120 billion neuron cells supersegmentally. When we say that, meaning that they're all within our, our cranium, within our brain, within our cerebellum, and within our brain stem. We'll talk a little bit about those areas as we progress through. Not only are there neurons, though, and these are the, the, cer uh, the cells that are carrying signals from our body to our brain and from our brain back to our body, but we also have supportive cells, what, what they've called neuroglial cells for, for many years. Um, there's different types. Um, there's astrocytes, microglial, gligodendrocytes, swan cells, and epidermal cells. You guys don't need to know that, but those are just some of those supporting cells. Um, they are important when it comes to overall brain function. Though we always think about brains just being neurons, but these other cells are very important as well, and we'll talk a little bit uh, on the next slide about that. This is a diagram of what a nerve cell looks like. What it has is we have what we call a cell body, and this is what is really um, highly concentrated up in our brains and our spinal cords, okay? The rest of this is what we call the axon, and that's what's going through all the different pathways in our, in our spinal cords. There's, they exist in our brain as well because, again, these are very small cells. Um, 
So they exist everywhere throughout the, the, the nervous system, but they're very highly concentrated, like I said, in, in brain tissue. Whereas this is more what we find out in your, your arms, your legs, the, what we call the peripheral nervous system, certain nerves. Like if you heard a carpal tunnel, you have a median nerve entrapment, it's because this area out here is getting ticked off and it's not allowing information to be sent all the way to and from um, that nerve cell body that lives up here in the brain or in the spinal cord, okay? As you can see, this is a cell just like any other cell. It has all the internal workings, and I'm not going to take you through cell biology, but we have to understand that this is a living entity that needs to be, it needs to have certain nutrients, and it has to have certain environmental <coughs> factors in order for it to survive and be healthy, okay? Um, one other quick thing. We call this little covering around the outer part of the axon that, that the nerve um, signal passes through, we call this um, a myelin sheath. It's made up by a bunch of cells. And what happens is the, the internal parts of the cell just get kind of squeezed out. And this is all fatty, okay? And that's going to become very important as we talk about important nutrients for the brain and for neurological health because essential fats are very, very important because they give us this protective covering. Just like insulation around an electrical wire, you can almost think about this nerve cell being a part of an electrical wire. So it's that big orange cord that you plug into the wall and you like run your, uh, you know, your different lawn equipment and things like that. Well, what happens if you go in and you, you start to kind of cut in through that is you'll see that there's lots of different um, fibers going through there. And that's exactly what we'd see. This is just one of those fibers that's contributing to that whole uh, electrical wire essentially. Okay, so like I said, this is just that insulation that goes around each of the wires, okay? Um, I told you we talked a little bit about these cells. The astrocyte forms an important <coughs> function in our brain called the blood-brain barrier. It's important because our circulation, our blood, does not just dump right into our brain. This forms a, a selective filter, essentially. It doesn't let just anything in there. It, our brain is very particular about what gets in and what gets out, okay? Um, as compared to a lot of the rest of our tissues where stuff just gets ex exchanged across the, the capillary beds, no problem. This cell is very selective, as I said. But what can happen is with certain types of degenerative conditions and certain types of environmental factors, this can start to break down and make this leaky, meaning that things can leak into our brains that shouldn't be there, um, like toxins and heavy metals, um, allergens, food components that shouldn't be there. Um, inflammatory products, those types of things, and we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go on. They work uh, a little bit in conjunction here with this, what we call a microglial cell, and this is kind of the immune system within the brain. This cell will go in and if there's something that infects the brain, or if there's a traumatic insult to the brain and there's inflammation going on, this cell is going to be activated. That's a good thing, because it goes in just like our, the rest of our immune system and it cleans up the debris and it takes care of whatever is going on within our brain. But the problem with this is, and what we're finding from uh, research into people that have concussions, is that this cell will get turned on, and if you get hit multiple times, it'll stay activated. Or if there's a continued stressful insult, it will continue to be activated, and it won't go away. And that's why people deal with um, brain degeneration caused from uh, concussions or head injuries, mild traumatic brain injuries, all the way through life. But a lot of the times those happen when we're younger. Um, we have pinnable cells, and those just create uh, what we call cerebral spinal fluid, and it, it kind of leaks in and causes, uh, it leaks into different areas around the brains to, to give fluidity to those areas. Um, and then there's the oligodendrocytes, and again, those are just the Schwann cells, that, that protective covering, the, the insulation, but only in the central nervous system in our brain and our spinal cord, okay? So, enough of the anatomy, the cell biology, mm -hmm. all that stuff. What we really want to know about basic brain function is this. Our brain exists to survive. Everything that it does is to try and make us survive longer, okay? It controls the body in an effort to survive. That would be uh, all the normal functions that we think about on a daily basis, like eating, sleeping, those things happen so that we can survive. Um, things that we don't have to think about, thankfully, anymore because we have a very highly developed brain, breathing. We don't have to think about breathing. We're all naturally breathing, you know, 12 to 16 breaths per minute. Don't have to think about it. Our heart is beating. We don't have to think about it. Our digestive system is, is passing um, uh, food through and digesting, absorbing nutrients. So it's all about survival, and your brain is what is coordinating and controlling all of it. 
the brain works by taking sensory information in and then it puts out motor information based on the sensory information coming in. And that's very important because the sensory information coming in it will come from a myriad of sources we'll talk about as we go on here. But if we aren't getting sensory information, we're not going to get good motor output. We're not going to get good muscle control. And we'll talk about what some of those muscles are as we go through as well. Another kind of interesting thing is that we think about our brain being active and doing things, and, and it does. But the majority of what our brain does is actually inhibits things. I'll let that sink in for a second. Our body is, is so amazingly created that it will automatically undertake a lot of different uh, activities without us, like I said, even thinking about it. Um, when we think about our heart, if we take our heart out of our chest, it will continue to beat as long as it's getting a steady flow of, of oxygen. Okay? If we take our digestive system out of our, our body and it's no longer connected to our brain, we'll continue, it will continue to push food through. It functions independently of our brains. The brain is there simply to say, digest more right now, let's not digest so much right now. Let's speed up the heart rate, now let's start to regulate it and pull it back. But there's certain, um, almost like a metronome, our, our body will work at a certain frequency without the brain even having any input. So the brain is there to stop certain motions. And maybe you've seen people before that maybe have like a tremor. They've lost inhibition of their, their ability to control their motor system in their body. Um, there's lots of different examples of that, that we're not going to go into right now. Just to, so you kind of have that, that that's, that's what the brain is really doing. 90% of the brain's output is actually inhibiting. It's dampening down things that we don't want to be happening, okay? Sensory and motor. Sensory would include things like touch, you know, things that we would feel in, on our skin. Um, smell, so things that are coming in through our nose and, and our, um, we call our olfactory epithelium that hit there and they go into the brain. Taste light that comes in from our eyes and gives us visual images, uh, sound, movement, muscle length, all those things are constant sensory inputs from our body into our brain. Things I didn't put up here though that are also sensory is that our brain is also very aware of how many times our heart is beating, how much is going through our digestive tract, how many calories we have eaten, what pH our blood is at. There's just so many things, again, that we don't have to think about that just happen automatically, what we call autonomically in the nervous system, that are all sensory related, and then the brain turns around and says, okay, this is the change that we have to make in order to maintain what we call homeostasis, or to maintain balance, survivability in the nervous system. So things with like musculoskeletal movement, so the th stuff we would think about, like moving our arms, moving our legs, walking, but um, smooth muscles, so our organ systems and our glands, even right down to our our, the size of our arteries is regulated by our nervous system. Um, even, and, and this is kind of, again, one of those things you have to wrap your mind around a little bit. I know it took me a while when I was going through my neurology diploma program, is cognition is actually a form of motor output. It's not actually moving anything. It's not closing a sphincter or, or pushing uh, you know, a, a hormone out into circulation. But cognition is essentially an output of our, our brain. And again, it, it's something beyond even my comprehension. There are neuroscientists out that are, are trying to figure out how all this works, but we can actually see disorders of cognition because of uh, issues going on within the brain, and, and we see those neurodegeneratively later in life with dementias, uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, those types of things. So again, cognition is, a, is a, something that we can look at, we can assess, kind of like we did initially to say, how is your motor system working? Okay. Again, I know it's, it's, it's mind-blowing. When we look at the brain, there's, there's essentially four functional lobes of what we call our cerebral cortex, our higher functioning centers of the brain, okay? We have our frontal lobe, we have our parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe. Temporal lobe has a lot to do with our hearing. Um, that's one of the main functions, sensory, that goes into there. But it also has some regulation of memory, uh, it also helps us some with our, our circadian rhythm and um, hormonal release, those types of things. So it's a very important section of the brain. Occipital lobe is, is important, but <laughs> the kind of funny thing is, is like the only thing that happens in the occipital lobe is vision. But vision is absolutely huge. Um, you know, if you think about what we get from our environment from vision, um, it's quite amazing. If you lose that, it's a huge um, sensation coming into your, your body that, that needs to be there. 
your parietal lobe handles a lot of the sensation coming in from the body, being like when we start to assess people and say, do you feel this the same as you feel this? Do you feel vibration here? Do you feel light touch? Do you feel hot? Do you feel cold? Do you have, when we do an adjustment, we're firing up this parietal part of, of your brain. So that's kind of the main functionality of that, but it also helps us with like spatial orientation and awareness um, with our environment as well. The frontal lobe is probably the coolest lobe and what really makes us human, and that is because it gives us behavior. It gives us uh, our ability to think higher cognitively other than I need food and I need to reproduce, um, which is kind of the more animalistic side of, of, of the brain. This allows us to have social interaction. It allows us, and pro proper social interaction, allows us to be cognitive, to think, to reason, uh, to have philosophy. All these types of things come because of our frontal lobe. And this is also where we get um, our movement, mo the majority of our movements, musculoskeletal movement comes from. Um, this area right here in front of this black line, what we call the primary motor strip. So our frontal lobes are very important with, with uh, like I said, higher cognitive types of functions and also the fact that we can do so many amazing things with our bodies, with different movements in our fingers, our legs, uh, and, and coordinate them well. Um, but there's also some other things that come into play here, <coughs> specifically our cerebellum. Our brain has a lot of, this big part of our brain has a lot of neurons in it, a lot. The cerebellum is estimated to have, a, b between the, the two here, uh, I believe it's like a, a, a one to four ratio, meaning that this small little area down here has the majority of the neurons that are actually in our brain, okay? It's like, I, I think it's like 20 billion compared to like almost 80. Um, I have to look at the number to get, but something uh, compared to that. And that's because this is what's responsible for us to be able to take our finger and touch it right to our nose without having to look at it. Or to do motor planned programming, things that you don't have to think about. Like you just get up and you start walking. You don't have to think about that. You don't have to think about the words that you're forming. They just kind of come out as, as you cognitively come up with them. But what happens when our cerebellum starts to degenerate, we start to have problems like this. Or we start to have kind of a vocal tremor. These are the types of things that can happen when our cerebellum isn't working very well because it finely tunes all of our movements. It also, what we're finding is finely tunes our thoughts. So if you have that thought that just kind of seems like keeping keep on escaping and it, it, it doesn't come back, it can be, and again, we're not quite sure about this yet, but what they're showing in the research is it might be related to your cerebellum not functioning the way it's supposed to, okay? Um, this shows a couple other different areas within the brain. Um, the thalamus is really what processes <coughs> sensory information coming in, but it has also some other projections that we're not going to talk about, but it is a very important part of our brain. Our hypothalamus and our hippocampus uh, are very important for um, hormones, but also for the hippocampus, some in memories, but the hippocampus has a lot of, of regulatory control over this hypothalamus. Um, we have our brain stem, and this is a really important area of our brain, and I talked to you about some of those things that just happen automatically, almost rhythmically. A lot of those things live in the lower part of our brain stem here in the medulla. Sorry, medulla. So we have the midbrain, or the, the mesencephalon, the pons, and then the medulla living down here. So that's where a lot of our eye movements come from. It's where um, Facial sensation, taste, smell, uh, all come from our cranial nerve um, inputs here. Uh, but even things like being able to balance our vestibular system, our auditory system, all comes through there. Um, and then again, our digestive system, our cardiovascular system, our tongue, all these things that, again, some of the things we don't have to think about, um, but a lot of the, the motor things that happen around our face all happen in this area. Now, have any of you been to any of my other presentations that I've done? either about digestive system or detox, those types of things. Yeah, okay. So some of you already know kind of where I'm going with this, and I love talking about the digestive system. <clears throat> but I'm not going to talk a lot about it because I've talked a lot about it in other <coughs> presentations that I've done. But the, the gut, our digestive system, is so important because it has 100 million neurons just in and of itself. It has essentially its own nervous system that functions, like I said, independently of anything else. There are lots of neurochemical influences uh, similar to what we have in the brain. We'll talk about some of those brain chemicals as we go on, but um, there's been some research that's shown that, that we use very small amounts of serotonin actually in our brain. The majority of it actually is used in our digestive system. So an interesting thing. So all the similar um, neurochemical types of things with neurotransmitters exist in our gut, and they, they exhibit different types of effects. But I just wanted you to know that. 
the thing that, again, I want you to understand from this is that our second brain, our, our gut, our digestive system, gives us significant environmental input. Meaning anything we take into our body, whether that be stuff we, we plan on taking into our body or whether we just kind of take it in without knowing it, like different types of fungi, bacteria, viruses, um, or if it's the food that we're eating, is all coming in and our brain has to assess and say, are we getting the nutrients that we're needing? Are we getting uh, the essential fatty acids? Are we getting the micronutrients, the macronutrients? Um, are we getting bacteria? Are we getting an infection that we need to be aware of? So the brain keeps very, very close watch over what's going on in our digestive system. And, and a large part of our digestive system will affect the functionality of our brain. That's why I bring it up here. Um, we talked about leaky gut early, or leaky brain earlier, when that, those, those oleodendrocytes um, start to break down, or sorry, the astrocytes start to break down that, that blood-brain barrier. Um, when we have a, a gut barrier that is not holding strong anymore, we can start to have a brain barrier that's not holding strong anymore because of inflammation uh, and, and neurochemical processes. Um, this is just another little illustration that kind of shows the path of what we call this vagus nerve that comes out of that medulla portion of your brain. And you can see that on this brain stem is controlling um, different muscles here around our larynx, our lungs, our heart, uh, our stomach, our intestines, our liver, our pancreas, our gallbladder, um, our spleen. I mean, everything almost comes off of this vagus nerve. So there's a lot of dysfunction that can happen when we have um, brain dysfunction happening in our brain stem, okay? and it doesn't necessarily just stay in that area. Um, this is an <coughs> illustration I got from one of my professors who teaches in the, teaches in the, neuro, uh, the Neurology Diplomate Program, Dr. Rosenthal, and he put it together from a, another one of the professor's lectures. And what it shows is that even though we have all these separate areas, and we like to think about, okay, there's a frontal lobe, there's a temporal lobe, a parietal lobe, and, a, and an occipital lobe, those areas all are together. They're just kind of functionally divided because we found that these certain things go in these different areas, but they all talk together. Um, and these arrows, and I'm not going to go through and explain all these, but just to show all this interconnectivity that happens in our nervous system um, between all these structures that we have talked about here, uh, it's, it's amazing. So if one thing starts to go wrong, everything else can start to suffer because of it. So the brain, what does it require in order to be functional? But before we get into that, another little test for you guys. And this is one I just kind of want you to uh, assess for yourself. Is, or sorry, no, this is, this is a, one you guys are going to participate with me on, okay? This is, this is a fun one to do, especially with my ADD and ADHD kids, okay? Um, so nobody here has ADD, right? This is called contrasting. And what that means is when I show you one finger, you show me two fingers. When I show you two fingers, you show me one finger. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so we'll just do a couple repetitions of this. You guys play along if you want, okay? We do two. What do we get? Perfect. Good. Okay. You guys did pretty good with that. Now we make, we kind of take it up a notch. We take it to the next level. This is called the go-no-go -no -go test, okay? When we do this, we do it the same as the first test. So if I show you one, you show me two. If I show you two, you do nothing. Oh, tricky. I, very tricky, okay. okay. I know, exactly. We do one right after the other. So we do. Remember, when I do two, nothing. nothing. Yeah, ready? Okay, I started you guys out hard. <laughs> I know, it's hard, isn't it? <laughs> like I told you guys, the majority of the brain's output is inhibitory. And sometimes when we don't inhibit, we look, mm, oh, we want to do that. We do another test in neurology called an anti saccade test. We do fast movements from one side to the other, and we say, look at my thumb when it wiggles. And they have the patient look at the thumb, and then we say, back to the middle, and they come back to the middle. But then we do follow it up with a test where we do what we call anti saccades I mean, when we wiggle this, I want you to look at the other thumb. And it's so hard for people to go from one to the other. Yeah. It's that same type of thing. It's turning on those inhibitory centers within our brain and saying, don't do that. And those kids that are you know, going around and the teacher's like, stop, stop, stop. And they're like, not stopping. That's the type of thing that's going on within their brain, OK? So brain requirements. What do we need? We need fuel. We need activation. We need nutrients. And we need neurometabolic factors to be working well. And I'll explain to those 
those to you a little bit more as we go through. First thing is fuel. When we talk about fuel for a brain, um, obviously we don't take it down to the station and fill it up with Petro. Um, what we do need, we need oxygen. We need blood glucose or sugar. But our brain can also function very well on what we call ketones. Ketones are, are products of fat breakdown. Okay? So oxygen is, is required pretty much by, is required by every cell in the body. That's why we have a circulatory system to bring oxygen and nutrients out to it. That's why we have a respiratory system to exchange oxygen across our lungs and then blow off the, the waste product, the carbon dioxide, okay? Oxygen is important, it's vital. If you don't have oxygen, you don't make energy. That's what oxygen is really made, is used for. It's called a terminal electron acceptor. You guys don't need to know that, but in our mitochondria that helps us to form energy, so we need oxygen. We also need glucose. Glucose is a very efficient form of energy in our body. It's broken down, it has a lot of high energy bonds, and so it can be used to make what we call ATP, uh, adenosine triphosphate. Again, you don't need to know that, but uh, th these things are necessary in order for our body to have fuel. That ATP is kind of the energy currency. Like I said, the, the brain can also use ketones, so in a time of starvation, what your brain will do, or what your body will do, is it will start to activate certain different systems that will go in and start to break down fat within your tissues. Um, and if it goes long enough, it'll start to break down even proteins. But it'll go through all of its, its glucose stores and it'll start to break down fats. But our brain actually works very well on these ketone bodies and, and, and the, fatty, the fatty tissue breakdown. We also need activation. And activation from the brain really means the sensations coming in, okay? Sensations, we talked about already, touch, smell, light, taste, sound, muscle length, and movement. All of these things give us an opportunity to put information or activation into the brain, okay? One of the most simple explanations of what we do as chiropractic neurologists is that a, 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 um, a medical neurologist will give people medications that will affect activation of the brain in one way or another. Um, what we do as chiropractic neurologists is trying to determine, okay, what area of the brain is not working as well as it's supposed to, and what can we do to try and activate that area knowing the different pathways, the different <laughs> circuitry that exists, can we use any of these to try and do a similar type of thing? Can we activate the brain in a way to make it work better? So this is what the brain needs in order to survive. If you put somebody tied up in a black room with no sound and let them develop that way, they will not be human. And, and sometimes kids are, are deprived of one of these if they've been, say, brought up in an orphanage in, in, in a different country where they've been swaddled so tightly and, and not been exposed to love and care and just movement. Um, they may develop hypotonic types of, of conditions. They might develop um, sensory processing disorders because they don't know what sensations are like because they were never allowed to move uh, as they were younger. They never had somebody talk to them or hold them. Um, those types of things. So if you completely derive somebody of their sensory systems, they will not develop into a human that you would recognize, okay? And, and not, not having cognition like we have or the ability to, to do many of the things that we do as humans, okay? One of the main things I like to talk about with people, um, and you guys are here because you want some good solutions for how you can help your brain to be healthy, and movement is probably the easiest one of, of these things to really work on directly. Um, I have a couple examples up here. Even just getting out and walking for 15 to 20 minutes a day um, has been shown to reduce the prevalence of neurodegenerative conditions in, in elderly population, populations, especially the sooner that they start to do it in life, the better off they are. Um, Dr. Martins is going to do a, a workshop on depression, I believe. It's in a month or two. And the, the title of it is, I believe, Move It or No, that's Immune Function. He, he's doing something about depression. He's going to talk about how movement helps to, to alleviate depression. Um, and they've actually done studies that show that different types of movement and getting, again, uh, four to five days, um, 15 to 20 minutes a day is, is as effective as, as taking a medication in many circumstances, okay? Um, doing things like yoga, which doesn't seem like you're doing a whole lot of movement, but what you're doing is you're firing in your, your vestibular systems and your balance systems and your muscle length um, information is all going into your brain and it's changing. Um, our bodies weren't made to be big, huge, muscle-bound and tight. They were made to be flexible and mobile and move. That's how we get the maximum amount of information going into our brain. And so yoga, those types of, of um, 
exercise modalities are really good for us. And then of course, my favorite, doing adjustments with people. Uh, and adjustments are great from a chiropractic standpoint um, because they help to alleviate physical stress and stress on the nervous system. But we can actually do different things because again, we can take pathways in, in the body that we know exist neurologically and we can then target and say, okay, if we want to work more one side of the brain or the other, if we want to work more one portion of the brain or the other, we can do different adjustments to try and, and target that area, okay? So, chiropractic plays a huge role in that activation system. Nutrients, um, and again, if you want more information on digestive health and nutrients, I did that whole video on, on digestive health last year and then did one about gluten and genetically modified foods and food sensitivities earlier this year. I'm not going to talk much about this, but food should be nutritive. It should be giving us building blocks that we need. It should be giving us carbohydrates and fats and protein. Those are the essential things that we need for life. We don't need all of these man-made products in our food that our body then has to detoxify and get rid of and can cause mechanical or it can cause chemical stress in our bodies, okay? Food sensitivities are another thing that is kind of hard for people to wrap their minds around, but um, sometimes our immune system is activated when we eat certain types of foods. When our immune system becomes, becomes activated in our digest, digestive system, it can start to then affect the immune system in our brains. There's a big connection here. They call it the gut-brain access, meaning the brain talks to the gut, the gut talks to the brain, and so if one starts to go bad, the other one's going to start to go bad too. So food, what we're putting in our bodies for fuel is very important. Some of the, the most important nutrients um, from a neurology standpoint, essential fatty acids, again, we have to maintain that insulation around the nerve cells um, and just give the, the proper nutrients that, it, that the neuron needs to be able to survive. B vitamins, and specifically methylated B vitamins, are very important for making neurotransmitters, but also for keeping the, the structure of the neuron very healthy. Um, and then trace minerals are also needed for making all of our neurotransmitters. Iron is one that is extremely um, important for making all of our major neurotransmitters. So, as I said, neuron structure and our neurotransmitters all really re requires that we have good, proper nutrition in our bodies. But also brain inflammation, which inflammation is kind of that, that it's hard to explain what it really means, but we talked about that immune cell activation. When, when something bad is going on with our di digestive system, or say if we get a concussion and we have to clean up debris within uh, that injury site in our brain, there's brain inflammation that happens. And to a point, it is a good thing. Because like I said, the immune system has to be activated so that it will clean up all the, the junk that happens. But if it goes on for too long a period of time, it can start to become destructive and, and cause us to have issues. Okay? Um, think about inflammation anywhere. If you cut yourself or if you, you, know, you end up um, running into something and, and you get a bruise, that type of a thing. There's inflammatory processes that are going on there and eventually it heals up and goes away. But um, sometimes inflammation doesn't go away, say in the case of like an arthritis. Um, and if you're, it continues to be an inflamed joint, inflamed joint, inflamed joint, and then eventually you get it replaced. So that type of thing can also happen in our brain, but unfortunately we cannot replace our brains, okay? Um, this is what I call the brain web, and I'm still kind of working on putting some of this together. I put all the arrows here from all these different systems going into the brain, but the problem is, is that there's arrows going between all these different structures here too, and we have our adrenal glands and our thyroid gland and our liver and our pancreas and our heart, our cardiovascular system, our digestive system, our stomachs, um, and different aspects of our immune system, whether it be uh, humoral immunity or, or natural and innate immunity. Um, we can have issues in all these different areas, and they all can affect the brain, the brain can affect all of them, and they roughly all can affect each other. So that's why it's so very important we're talking about metabolic factors. If we don't have good, and I kind of classify all these things as metabolic factors, if we don't have all these things working very well, our brain is not going to work well, okay? So like, I, I, if you haven't learned already, if you can't have healthy digestion and have a healthy brain, or uh, unhealthy digestion and have a healthy brain, okay? Same thing, you can't have unhealthy circulation and still have a healthy brain. You can't have fluctuations of blood sugar and still have a healthy brain. You can't have chronically elevated stress activation of your adrenal system and continue to maintain a healthy brain. Um, same with toxicity, immune activation, inflammation, and digestive function, which I talked about already, and, and if you have hormone imbalance, all those things can contribute to dysfunctional brain function. Okay? Which is a really good lead into our next little topic here, which is going to be brain dysfunction, okay? 
Sorry, I was getting dehydrated here a bit. Probably tells me I'm talking too much. <clears throat> Dysfunction basis, uh, the basics of this. Like I said, if neurodegeneration is greater than plasticity, this is the opposite of the situation that we want. <coughs> then we're going to have dysfunction starting to pop up within our, our nervous system and our brain. Causes of this, um, I listed just a few of them up here. There's a rather extensive list, but just kind of putting them all together would be, we can have traumatic. So again, if you get hit in the head or you get hit somewhere out in your nervous system or, or something gets cut, um, you can have toxic um, that would come from different toxins being uh, present in the body, or you can have metabolic factors as well. Um, and I kind of lumped a lot of things together into these categories. You can expand them out a lot more, but this is just kind of the basics of it. We just talked about metabolic a little bit, so you have a, a little bit better understanding for some of those things. These are some early signs of having some brain dysfunction or brain demise, okay? We can have smell start to decrease. That's one of the things that they say in Parkinson's patients <coughs> usually is, is starting years before the, the symptoms even start to set in. Um, they have loss of smell, bowels that don't move very quickly, so chronic constipation, and they oftentimes have a lot of shoulder soreness from their, their posture already starting to kind of go south, okay? Um, so decreased smell is one of those, and I, I mentioned another two of them right there. Um, and posture, poor posture is another thing that you don't see up here, but can be a, an early sign of brain de demise. Um, fatigue with mental activity, meaning that you know, you're in a conversation with somebody, and it's like a really in-depth conversation that you're having, you're just kind of like, whoa, you're getting tired. Or you're reading a book and you, and you just feel like, I have to put this book down, I can't keep on reading it. Um, or you're listening to something, you're trying to listen and comprehend maybe a class like this, and you're just like, <laughs> I need to take a nap. Um, these are the types of things that can start to show, okay, maybe we're having a little bit of, of brain dysfunction that's starting to come up. Depression is something that they are classifying as an early sign of brain dysfunction. Um, dysfunctional digestion, talk about that already. Uh, and just kind of having an overall foggy feeling within your brain, being like, my brain is just not working very well, okay? Those are all some early signs. The assessment forms that I gave you that have the, the zero to three scales on them and lots of different questions you can go through and fill out, those have a lot of different other signs of degeneration that can be happening. And, and it kind of breaks it down, and I know how all this, the different questions correlate to different symptoms um, that people are dealing with and how those translate then into, okay, what part of the brain might not be working as well as it's supposed to, or what neurochemical, what transmitter in the brain might not be working as well as it's supposed to. Um, so the brain function assessment form, the brain health and nutrition assess assessment forms are things that I use with my patients before going in and doing an exam with them so I know, okay, this is what we need to be targeting in on, this is what we need to talk about, this is what we need to be specific uh, in what we're looking for. So you can read through that because there's a lot of other signs of brain dysfunction that can happen more progressed um, in some circumstances. Um, so read through that at your own leisure. We don't have time to go through all of them, unfortunately. But um, they're great forms um, to really kind of hone in and see, OK, what's going on in my brain? If you see a lot of threes, maybe we should have a talk, OK? If you what? I said, if you have a lot of threes, maybe we need to have a talk, OK? If, you have, if you're like all zeros all the way down, you, you've got a, a darn good functioning brain, OK? <laughs> All right, how's everybody doing so far? Are we doing okay? I see lots of smiles, so hopefully that means you guys aren't just like, yeah. <laughs> Glass over. Ah, another test. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. yes. It's like school, isn't it? Okay, this one um, I'm not going to have you do. This is an example of what we call a Stroop's test, okay? Uh, a Stroop test, okay? What it is, we have all these different uh, words up here representing colors, but we have different colors representing each word. And so the test is to go through and read and say, don't say red, but you say blue, black, yellow, red, green, and go all the way through that way. And then you turn around and do the opposite. So it, it, again, it, it kind of forces your brain to work a little bit harder. Okay? You do have to think about it. You do have to think about it. And then the problem is, just like I did before, then I switch it up on you, and then you have to do the opposite. Exactly. So this is an example of, have you guys heard of Lumosity.com? Yes? Okay. Yeah. It's great. I do it every day. It's got some great exercises to help with your cognitive, uh, cognitive exercise. 
Um, and they have a test like this where it flashes up two cards and you have to say, does it does the one match the other? And you say yes or you say no. Um, it's really cool. You can do it on your phone. You can do it on your iPad. You can do it on the computer. Um, and it's a really great way to work out your brain. So this is a thing, uh, a tool that you can use, uh, lumosity.com. Um, there's You can do like a month for free. Um, and then after that, if you want to continue with it, there is a subscription fee. But I think it's like... Seventy-six dollars a year. Yeah, and if you do like a family plan, and you find three other, three or four other people that want to go in on it with you. It's a little bit cheaper too. So, and you can encourage other people in your life to have their their brains be healthy. Okay, but it looks at uh, a few different areas. It looks at memory. It looks at the speed of, of processing of information, problem solving, flexibility, and attention. So it kind of groups all the different assessments that it does, and then the games, games, just like the games I'm doing with you guys tonight. Um, some of them are definitely not as fun as others, but uh, but it then it will then track it for you, and it'll see: Are you improving? Are you suffering in, in certain areas? Do you need to work more on certain exercises than others? Okay, so really cool tool that we has been developed over the last uh, probably decade or so, and they've done some research into these things, and they and they really do work. Um, some other exercises you can do for brain, and what I'll tell you guys, I'll kind of preface this, is that usually these exercises are recommended after doing an evaluation, um, meaning that you can do some olfactory or smell identification, and it's good for you, but sometimes you might want to be working more one side or the other um, of your nostrils based on what side of the brain you're trying to, to improve functionality of. Same with eye movements and vestibular activation. But, um, being able to, like I said, smell and identify smells, so you might just want to occasionally test yourself, you know, turn the label away, open something up, be like, can I tell what that is? And you turn around and see if you got it right. Uh, you can do this with things like essential oils, but even like in the spice cabinet. Um, you can even have your spouse test you or, or a good friend. Um, but being able to smell and identify is a very important thing. Okay, that's an early sign of brain degeneration. Eye movements. Um, and again, we talked about like reading, and sometimes you kind of get fatigued and your eyes start to get a little fuzzy. We can work on things that help to strengthen eye movements. Um, and, and those who strengthen eye movements, they help to strengthen the brain. Some of the games in Lumosity are based on, um, on moving your eyes to certain positions and, and taking in some sensory information and answering some questions about it. So uh, again, good ways to exercise your, your brain is by moving your eyes. Vestibular activation. And our vestibular system, our balance and coordinative system, um, that also helps control our eyes. Um, and that, that whole issue, like when people have vertigo and they turn their head and all of a sudden they feel like they're gonna fall over, that's all vestibular system. So you can work your vestibular system by doing balance training, by doing exercise uh, with your eyes again. Um, one of the very basic ones that I do for patients is one where you have them hold the, the thumb out in front of them, and you just rotate your head, keeping your eyes fixated on this, on, on your thumb, not moving at all. Um, it seems very basic and very easy, but you'd be surprised that as you start to do that, you start to get a little like low, lightheaded, or um, maybe having a hard time following, if somebody's actually watching you, they might see your eyes come off and then come back to the target like this. Again, showing signs of some brain fatigue. The more you work on those things, the better off you're going to be. Auditory stimulation. We didn't necessarily talk about this, but if you listen to something just in your left ear, 60% of that information is going to go over to your right brain and be perceived in that right temporal lobe, as compared to 40% on, on the left side. So you can kind of work, again, one side versus the other based on just putting information in one ear versus the other. Visualization, this is one that's really cool and I tell my patients about a lot when they, they're complaining about exercising and I tell them, like, you can actually get like 50 to 60% of the benefits of exercise just by thinking about it. But if you actually go through and visualize something and you really actually think through the process of what would I be doing if I was going to go out and run for three miles. Now you have to be thinking about it for as long as it would take you to run three miles to get the whole benefit. But you can actually fire off everything but the motor pathway everything in your brain would be activated, except for, just like me, if I thought about, okay, I want to move my right arm and touch it to my nose, and if I envision myself and think about myself doing that, it, it actually fires the neural circuitry, but I don't actually bring my finger up and touch my nose. Really cool stuff. Visualization, um, and, and then they talk about that with regards to like athletes, and they like visualize what's going to happen during an event or during a game. This stuff really works. Um, gargling and singing, something that we can do to help stimulate our palates, and a lot of us have bad palatal uh, responses. I mean, we go and we start to touch the back of the throat, 
and either we get like a really hyper response, or, like, or you don't get anything at all. <coughs> either one is, is not the ideal situation. And that is a part of that neural pathway that is controlling our cardiorespiratory centers, that's controlling our digestion. So a lot of times when I have people that are having <coughs> digestive issues, we start working on that gargle response. You can also do the same thing by just kind of belting out music, uh, belting out and singing. Maybe you don't want to do that when other people are around, but when you're home alone, go ahead and you can, you can work your palate and, and that vagus nerve, that cranial nerve 10. Um, complex movements are something else that we give. Um, to kind of work through cerebellar and vestibular activation. Um, and there's lots of examples of that I'm not necessarily going to go into. Um, and breathing, conscious breathing, getting oxygen into the system is very, very important. But even it, just as you're kind of consciously thinking about that breathing, the breath coming in through the nose, and you're just feeling the sensations of it, your rib cage is moving. There's lots of different sensory things that are ha happening that are coming in and, and in, um, affecting your brain function on top of, as I said, oxygenation. So taking time to just kind of chill out, relax, breathe, focus breathe, breathing in through the nose slowly and out through the mouth, and doing the inhale for like four to six seconds and then exhaling for like eight to 12, prolonging the exhalation, blowing off carbon dioxide and bringing in more oxygen. Very, very important in helping our nervous system, okay? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I don't think you guys have enough room to do this, but I'll give you guys the opportunity. You can do this at home, okay? This is a, one of the things I check on almost every single neuro patient that I have every single visit, and that is doing a Romberg's test. What a Romberg's <coughs> test is you stand both feet together, just arms down to the side, and if you're doing bad here and you're starting to fall over, don't close your eyes, please, okay? <laughs> if you're doing this at home, make sure you do it in like a safe spot. Have somebody watching you. I always stand right here with my patients to make sure if they start to go, I'm there to catch them. But you stand, both feet together, and if you feel brave, you close your eyes. And sometimes what you'll see, you'll see a sway. <laughs> sometimes you'll see a step. Sometimes you'll see a fall, okay? Not, not usually do we see a fall here. Usually those types of things, they, they are, they're in the hospital. That's how bad those things are, okay? But we'll see some functional types of changes with regards to that. If you do okay with that, you take the right foot, step in front of the left, let it kind of settle, and then again you close your eyes. Okay? You do the opposite. Right before the left. You might notice, like me, my right side's always my worst side. There's usually a side that might be a little bit worse than the other, and that just tells us a little bit about how your brain is working one side compared to the other, okay? Uh, <clears throat> left and right and stand them. Can you stand on one foot? This is where I I'll oftentimes lose people. <laughs> They're like, no. So, but again, can you do this and can you do it with your eyes closed? Um, those are types of things that you can do to, to measure that balance, that, that proprioceptive information coming in from your legs, going up to your brain and saying, hey, this is where we're at, we're not falling over, our muscles are at a good length, so we're staying nice and stable. Uh, so, uh, really good testing, and like I said, when you take away the visual fixation, those visual cues, it takes it to a whole new level, okay? How many seconds should you do each of those? Well, you, you, test, uh, you test, and then I'll have people do it uh, frequently with um, like I, like I said, I'll have them do a certain number of seconds just based on how long they can go. So for some people, I might have them do it like five or six seconds with their eyes closed because that's all they can do. I might have another, uh, uh, other people do it for 30 or 40 seconds. So, okay. Um, and that kind of leads into some other basic brain exercises, which would be things like yoga. And we talked about that a little bit already. Balance training, which is exactly <coughs> what we were just talking about there. You can do balance training in other ways. Um, uh, something I was going to say with yoga, core activation, also very important because that helps to fire in through our, our spinal systems, our stabilization mechanisms, um, and all that fires into that vestibular area that helps our eyes, that helps our balance, that helps our coordination. Okay. Um, same with the balance training. Exercising within our metabolic capacity, meaning that I don't necessarily want everybody to go home and like run for miles and miles and miles, okay? But a great thing to do for people is to exercise within their metabolic capacity, um, meaning you want to get to a point where you're breaking a good sweat, where you're breathing pretty hard. For everybody, that's a little bit different, okay? But that is the end goal. You need to work with somebody who's qualified to give you some direction on this, though. 
I'm not saying go home and just start hitting all these these exercises really hard. Or like I said, go home and run a few miles. Um, we don't want to overtax or make it make a problem worse than it really uh, needs to be. Okay. Um, when we exercise within our metabolic capacity, but take it right to the brink, you know, where you're just like, I can't go another five seconds or else I'm going to pass out. <laughs> okay, that, that may be a, a bad example, but uh, where you're really, really getting up there, you get this huge release of what we call brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. And that is a chemical that causes, uh, that, that just contributes to the health of our brain and contributes to that plasticity we were talking about those neuron signals that, that are working together to give us proper brain function all of a sudden start working a whole lot better at that point and they start to make new connections. Okay, That was something I didn't tell you guys. We start life with a lot of nerve cells and many of them start to die off as we start to grow and develop and we make connections though. And we don't necessarily grow new nerve cells but we do grow new connections between them which is a pretty cool thing and that's really how plasticity happens is by, by um, by re creating these new connections between all the different nerve cells. So um, brain-derived neurotrophic factors is, is a way that we can do that. The other thing that happens when we exercise that intensity, we get a huge release of dopamine and serotonin. Um, and it also helps our acetylcholine systems, which um, dopamine is kind of your, uh, your motivational centers within your brain. Ser serotonin is your like feel-good centers and, and like my life is happy <laughs> types of thing. Acetylcholine is what helps us to have memory um, and cognition and also muscu uh, muscular movement and it's also important for uh, a lot of our automatic and autonomic functions within the body as well. Okay, So all very important things on top of the fact that when we exercise we increase <coughs> circulation which again getting oxygen, glucose uh, and fuel to the system is exactly what we need. Um, and then just supporting overall physiology. I have another form that I did not give to you guys that looks at all those other things that we looked at in that web. Um, it's called a metabolic assessment form, and that looks at a lot of those different areas that can be contributing to um, contributing to brain dysfunction because of the metabolic factors we've talked about, okay? Um, basic, basic brain nutrition, I've touched on a lot of this already, making sure we're getting lots of fats, specifically omega-3 fats are very important because um, they're anti-inflammatory, but they also go to build cell walls and that covering around the nerve cells. Protein is also very important. Um, to help maintain the, the, and again this is neurochemical, but to maintain proper nerve health, we need to have a good amount of protein in there so that it can build the structures that it needs to, so that it can make neurotransmitters that it needs to, uh, and so it can make energy as it needs to. Methylated B vitamins, we talked about those already. Vitamin D is very important just for every aspect of the, the body, including the brain. Uh, it has lots of receptors for vitamin D. 5-HTP, um, which is a, 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 a tryptophan derivative, is very important in making serotonin. Tyrosine is very important in making dopamine, which then contributes to making epinephrine and norepinephrine, so another two very important transmitters in our body. Resveratrol and turmeric are um, anti-inflammatories, botanicals, um, that can be used very effectively to help calm down neurodegeneration and that inflammation. I should say the inflammation that leads to neurodegeneration. Glutathione is also a very potent antioxidant that our body makes, um, but sometimes we don't make very much of it, uh, or um, we don't recycle it very well. It actually gets recycled within our body. Vimpocidin is a, um, it's again another herbal type of, of, of supplement that can be used to help increase blood flow without increasing blood pressure, which is a pretty cool thing. So for people who are having circulatory compromise, uh, vimpocidin and different um, uh, and, and products that have been positive in it can be very helpful. And then Huprazine A is a, something that has been um, something that has been demonstrated to be uh, helpful with the acetylcholine system, like we're talking about memory and cognition and, and avoiding neurodegeneration uh, through things like Alzheimer's. Um, Huprazine A can be very effective at that. Dietary factors, if you haven't gotten already, we need to eat good food. <laughs> Okay, um, and sometimes we don't know what good food is until we eliminate all the bad and then try to add it back in. Something that I call it, uh, or that is called an elimination provocation diet, meaning you get rid of all the junk for a while, and then you slowly add things back, and you say, "How do I feel after I eat this?" Um, for those of you who were at the the workshop we did last, uh, a couple months ago, we found out that gluten is something that very significantly impacts our nervous system negatively, and can cause a lot of 
neurological reactions, but also digestive types of responses as well. Which is why it's important to do gut repair, um, especially if you if you go through and do a questionnaire of that metabolic assessment form and it shows up, you probably have some digestive issues. It's a really important first step to take. That's something that I do with most of my neurometabolic patients as a first step, okay? Detoxification is kind of the second step of that program to kind of get some of the junk out of the body after we get everything healed up. Um, and something that, again, we could probably do a whole class on, and I uh, maybe it'll happen sometime, but caloric restriction, intermittent fasting, or a ketogenic diet, all kind of synonymous in many, many circumstances. But what they're showing is that when you don't, and we talked about this when we talked about the brain liking ketone bodies for energy, when we restrict our calories, our body has no choice but to go to our stores and fat, um, and that's actually shown to help reverse some neurological degenerative diseases, is restricting your calories. Um, sometimes fairly significantly, like to six to 800 calories a day, which if you guys actually count it out is very significant. So that's why I don't recommend you just go home and do this, okay? But this is just something that can be in the toolkit depending on what's going on in your body. Um, focusing on high intakes of healthy fats and proteins rather than carbohydrates can also kind of stimulate that, that as well. So even like just a low carb type of a diet can be really beneficial in this, uh, in this circumstance even if that means cutting back on fruits and vegetables. Um, where do I start? We gave you a lot of information tonight, and you're like, my goodness, there's a lot of stuff here. And I wanted to make sure you had more than enough. Um, and hopefully, like I said, some of those points that I talked about really hit home with you. As I told you before, not everyone needs to do or take everything that I talked about here. I was just kind of giving you some basics and general guidelines, um, some ideas, some things to be thinking about. <coughs> The best thing, and I kind of alluded to this already as well, the best place to start is with a, a history, a neurological history. Um, find out uh, what's been in your past, what's been in your family's past, what has your history been like. Um, and then doing the, the metabolic and the neurological questionnaires as you guys have. And then jumping in and doing a neurological exam to really kind of hone in and say, okay, what is going on and where is it going on at, okay? It's a great place to start. From there we can know how do we need to move, how do we need to exercise, how do we need to be adjusted, how do we need to eat, what foods should we be avoiding, what nutrients do we need to be taking into our body that we might be deficient in, and how are we thinking, how is our stress level, where is our mental place at right now. When we get those three things all back in line and working as they're supposed to, uh, our brain functions much better, okay?